everybody, and welcome to the Chicago State University College of Education webinar series on e-learning. We are so happy that you are all here and are looking forward to a great presentation by Dr. Rasha El Haj in the uh, College of Education Special Education and Graduate Studies Department. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Deborah Lynch, and I'm the organizer of this particular webinar. And so just wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of our session and some housekeeping items as well. So if you take a moment to kind of locate where things are on your control panel, you should be able to see a uh, raised hand feature. There'll be a couple of times that uh, you're going to be asked some questions and one way will be uh, with that raised hand feature. So if you could familiarize yourself with the raised hand feature. And uh, we encourage you to put your screen in full screen mode so you can clearly see the PowerPoint presentation. That would be helpful. Uh, and uh, the, um, a couple of other things. We want to give you an idea of uh, the format of the presentation. So uh, Dr. El Haj is going to present her full presentation and we're going to ask you to locate in your control panel the questions section. And as we go or at the end of the presentation, we're going to encourage you to put your questions in the question uh, section. And so our discussion uh, will revolve around the questions that come up for you as you're listening to the presentation and afterwards. So again, if you could locate the questions section in your control panel so you know where to uh, place your question. And uh, let's see, so our format again will be the presentation and then the question and answer session at the end. The session will be recorded and shared. So uh, after the session is over, you will get an email link from us with a copy of the presentation and a copy of your Illinois State Board of Education Certificate of Completion. So we have all your contact information and those will go to you in a link following the presentation. Finally, you're gonna be asked on the way out to complete a survey. Uh, we really want to hear your opinion about the webinar and uh, the things that you might have gotten out of it. And we also want to gather from you topics for our future webinars. We want to build this series around the topics and issues that you think are important and helpful in this new e-learning, remote learning environment. So those were a couple of things regarding housekeeping. And uh, let me move into the introduction of our presenter. Dr. Rasha El Haj is an assistant professor of special education at Chicago State University. She teaches online and hybrid courses in addition to face to face courses. She holds a PhD from Wayne State University in educational evaluation and research. She also holds a Master's of Arts in Special Education from Eastern Michigan University and a Bachelor's of Arts in Special Education from St. Joseph University International. For over 16 years, she was a special education teacher, 11 of which were in the Michigan public schools, including the cities of Detroit and Dearborn. She also worked as a consultant on school reform and international assessment for schools and ministries in the Middle East. Her research interest is the impact of vocational education on increasing independence for young adults with special needs and improving quality of life. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce to you Dr. El Haj. Dr. El Haj. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, for the introduction. And Thank you all for tuning in on this Thursday morning, on this cold Thursday morning. Um, so I hope you had or having a good cup of coffee. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning, kicking off the CSU weekly webinar series that should continue till about the end of the school year, covering the main theme of e-learning in its different aspects. Um, before we start hitting the content, 
I would like to know more about your role. So I am going to start by um, launching a poll question. And there it is. A pop up um, should uh, show on your screen. So if you could take if you could please take a few seconds to answer and I will share the results as soon as most of you pick their choices. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay. So no wonder 50% of you are special education teachers. So I'm not surprised, right? Um, so welcome everyone. And let's start the presentation. Okay. I shared the results, right? Okay, so now we're going to hide. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Welcome, special education teachers. Welcome, teachers. Welcome, paraprofessionals. Welcome, everybody. And let's start with this unprecedented situation of COVID 19, right? COVID 19 turned our entire world upside down. And I mean it literally. Like every country on this earth has been impacted, right? Millions of teachers had to change their teaching modalities. Um, and the transition to e learning, I'm sorry, I'm having some. Um, okay, so the transition to e learning was really not optional, right? We didn't really have a choice, it was a mandatory thing. Um, this was the only way uh, to switch. Um, to e-learning to meet the needs of our students who were who are locked down in their homes, and we are locked down in our homes. So, and here I would like to um, launch another quick poll to ask you uh, how prepared did you feel or do you feel uh, to teach online or remotely? So, do you feel very well prepared, somewhat prepared? You're not sure, or Little prepared, not prepared at all. Okay, so most of you answered and I am going to share the results. So look at the results. Only 2% feel very well prepared, right? Versus 35% little prepared and 28% not prepared at all. So that's over more than, um, I would say 60% of you do not feel prepared for this. And so are many teachers around the globe. You're not in this alone, okay? Um, so many teachers were not prepared. They felt frustrated um, and overwhelmed. Um, so we are really hopeful that this webinar will act as a lending hand um, to all of you, our hero teachers. You are out there on the front lines trying to do your best to meet the needs of your students. 
And I really hope that you will get some practical tips today um, that you can immediately use in your online classroom. So I want to start on a positive note. Okay, let's start on a positive note and a positive view. Um, E-learning should be viewed as a real opportunity for uh, individualized learning and meeting IEP goals, right? So right now I want you to uh, look at the raise your hand option. And I would like you to raise your hand um, and tell me how many times, or just, you know, if you've made statements like the following statements. Um, you've said, I wish I could do some one-on-one. -on -one. Or you've said, um, you know, this kid needs more time. Or he or she, they need to taught the prerequisites. They can't move forward if they don't have the prerequisites. Or I wish I could use a lower level reading material uh, because this is way too hard. This is beyond what they can do. So if you can raise your hand to tell me, have you made those statements before? Okay. So many of you have raised their hands because they have made similar statements. Right, I see a lot of hands raised. Um, so I strongly recommend that we see this transition to e-learning as an opportunity to really fulfill some of those wishes. Well, easier said than done, right? <laughs> um, because transitioning to from face-to-face -to, -face to an online format can be really challenging in addressing student-specific needs. We have some researchers suggesting that we need years to perfect the design of an online course. And what did we have? Like a week, two weeks stop? Uh, but the good news is that most teachers are resilient and you guys are awesome and you will deliver at the end of the day. So teachers, all they want is to have their students successful and you guys want your teachers to be successful online. So I suggest we take a look at the four skills that are required for successful online learning for typical students. Skill number one, reading and writing. Reading and writing are the main ways students communicate in an online class, right? Skill number two, independent learning. Students are expected to take charge of their own learning. Um, motivation, skill number three. In order to be successful online, the students have to want to succeed. They have to initiate uh, the work. They have to be willing to, um, you know, face the challenges. And of course, number four, um, computer literacy. You know, students will be communicating online with their teachers, with their classmates. Um, they need to participate in discussion forums. Um, send emails, um, watch video conferences, uh, write on chat platforms, they'll need to upload assignments, convert documents to PDF, conduct searches, etc. Right, that's awesome. Right. But wait, I'm going to ask you the following question through this fall. Obviously, most of you are special education teachers. Um, but for those of you, I mean, for everybody, um, how many of you deal with students who are, you know, teach exceptional students with exceptional needs, right? Most of you uh, teach students with exceptional needs. And then even if you are not a special education teacher, you probably have students in your classroom who are mainstreamed, uh, maybe you co-teach, you're a Jenna teacher, you co-teach with a special education teacher. Um, and I mean, most of you have some type of an exceptional learner in your classroom. At one point, um, it's difficult really those days to find a classroom where, you know, we don't have exceptional learners. So 94% of you 
and I'm sharing the results right now, 94% teach students with exceptional needs, right? So for those of you teaching students with exceptional needs, you know that the previous slides that um, talks about those four skills, well, our atypical students struggle with most of these skills, right? Many of them struggle with these skills. They struggle with reading and writing. They struggle with uh, being an independent learner with motivation, um, maybe or maybe not with computer literacy and computer skills. But you know, these are the four skills that are uh, required to be successful online, and our students struggle with them. So, in order to alleviate some of those struggles. I think it's important to look at what constitutes the pillars for the online classroom. So many researchers suggest that there are four pillars for the online classroom, organization, content, communication, and interaction. And I think providing accommodations within each of those pillars ought to help make our students with IEPs more successful in the online world. Um, so the following slides are going to be tips to make each of those pillars a little bit more accessible by our exceptional learners. I would also like to add that the suggestions in this guide are not revolutionary. But hold on, don't leave just yet. Once we go over those suggestions, they'll probably seem like common sense, but that's just the point. Teachers often fail to make connections between what we do in a physical classroom and what we do online. So hopefully what will follow will make that connection explicit to help you think about what you do well in person so that you can do those things in your online classes too. And we are going to start with organization, okay? First tip is to make sure your materials are easy to find. We all know that most of our students with disabilities are messy, unorganized. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Raise your hand if this sounds familiar. Um, so it's important to make things easy to find, right? Um, and here are two things to consider when you wanna make your material easy to find. You wanna think about your location. Right, whether it's a location on the desktop or your laptop, or it's a location on your learning management system. Um, so different districts are using different learning management systems, but you really want to make sure that um, your material is always posted in the same place so that students can find it. Another thing that you need to think about is naming your documents. You want to be consistent with naming your documents. Um, so. You can name them by the discipline and number of worksheet, or you can name them by uh, chapter and you know the type of assignment. So, for example, you could say you know math uh, worksheet number one. But if you do so, then you need to be consistent with all the rest of the namings. Or you can do um, um, digestive system. Let's say you're doing science uh, chapter one, section two, worksheet. So you would be consistent with that sequence of naming so that students can immediate, immediately recognize uh, the document and know what it's referring to. Um, second. Okay. Another tip is to provide a calendar with due dates. And if possible, you wanna encourage your students to have all of their other due dates from other teachers on that calendar, because that way you're helping them have everything in one place. Because we all know that our students forget and uh, you know they're not very good with due dates and they might remember due dates for one teacher, but not the, the other. So if possible, and if you are collaborating with the other teachers um, to help the student have a unified calendar where all the due dates are laid out, um, so that it's like it's a visual and it helps the students be a little bit more organized. Um, you also want to provide schedules to help visual schedules to help families organize the learning day. 
Um, so you could have like a visual template for the daily routine. And these visual schedules will not only help the parents, but it will also increase your students' independence. And really depending on your students, so you know your students and what they can handle. You can either create like longer schedules, visual schedules that span the entire day, or you might wanna to choose to offer multiple mini schedules with like fewer steps. Um, so it really depends on what level you're teaching and um, you know the, the, the severity of the disabilities that you're dealing with and you know your student best. So you choose what works for you and what works for them. And it's also important to include suggestions for movement breaks, right? You have parents who are expecting their kids to be, uh, you know, to study for four consecutive hours on, um, on the computer, right? And like, you know, this is like, and, and they'll say, well, imagine you're in school, imagine you're in class. So if you provide within those visual schedules uh, time where you are telling them to now, this is time to take a break. Um, you are providing some legitimacy so that those kids can go tell their parents, hey, the teacher said it, the teacher, look, it's built in the schedule. Um, you know, now it's time to break. I can have a five minute break or a 10 minute break. And those breaks are really important. Those breaks are important because, you know, they give the students can move away from the screen and they can re-energize, uh, grab, a, you know, grab something to drink or grab a quick snack and then come back with, a you know, a little bit more more energy so this provides legitimacy for parents so that like you know when you say oh the teacher said it's okay then it's going to be okay um also you want to repeat you want to review you want to summarize concepts for clarity um always include a summary a chat time before ending session and you know it's funny because i almost um uh, did not include a summary slide for this presentation because sometimes we are so focused on other things that we forgot to do what we know we need to do. Um, so it's always important to you know, include those revision and, and summary um, sessions or slides because like you can include a summary concept map, um, you can ask them for oral contributions or exit tickets and summarizing is super important especially for students with disabilities uh, because what you're really doing is that you're asking them to discern the most important ideas from the session and to ignore irrelevant information in other words it's a tool for you to check for understanding like who is really listening to you and who is totally in la la land right um so these are like important tips um for you to end your session with Also, you want to think about organizing your groups um, with purpose and being flexible, right? Yes, we can do groups in online classrooms and flexible grouping is really important because it can support differentiation while creating opportunities for all students. So in order for grouping to be effective, students must be able to change groups over time. So we do this in the face-to-face -face classroom. We also need to transfer this to the online classroom. And these are just different ways that we can use um, those different groupings. So you could have groups with homogeneous ability. Maybe let's say you have some type of problem solving learning that you need to, uh, um, you need to complete. So you would put them in um, homogeneous ability, or let's say you have a project-based learning. You wanna have heterogeneous groups. Um, or maybe you want to be practical and you know you created this really good material for reading comprehension skills and you have like three of your students who have the same goal in reading comprehension so it's okay to put all those three students even if they're not with the same ability but they share the same goal and you created that particular material for them so you could put them in a group so that they can work on that um, IEP goal and simply students who work well together right we can group them but the point here and, um, and the key here is to be flexible and constantly change your online groups just like you would do in your 
face-to-face uh, -face classroom. Now, you also want to avoid crowding your presentations if you're doing PowerPoint presentations and including both audio and visual format. Um, you know, as teachers, we have the tendency of wanting to share everything we know and all the content that we know with our students. Um, and sometimes we find it difficult to like fit everything in into one slide. And uh, so that's something that we kind of need to work on and just be concise and straight to the point. Um, and just, you know, have a lot of white space on your slides because then it's more attractive and it's more focused and God knows how much uh, focus our students with uh, IEPs um, need those days, right? Um, and also, you know, if you're using YouTube, uh, lots of pictures when possible, and you could, you know, add annotations to those pictures, um, close captioning for YouTube audio, um, that would be also a really good option for you and for the students and very helpful. Okay, so before we move on to the next slide, I want to launch another question for you. And I want to ask you about your students and their time on their cell phones. Okay, like students are on their on their cell phones most of the time. Right. Uh, so if you agree or disagree, and that's just not in the classroom. But like overall during their, you know, during life. So I'm waiting here for a few more. Okay, so about 50% agree that, you know, between the strongly agree and, and agree um, that students, or even more close to maybe 60%, that students are on their cell phones, you know, a large chunk of the time. Let me hide this. Okay, and well, now you're going to know the reason why I asked this question those questions. Okay. I am suggesting that you maximize the use of student cell phones, right? They have it handy. Um, and, you know, you might, we might as well use it. So we want them to use their timer or the alarm, you know, you know like, you know, time yourself. This worksheet should not take more than 20 minutes. And then we tell them, put the timer on on your cell phone or, um, you know, set the alarm for when the quiz, when, when the quiz starts. Um, put reminders, teach them how to use the reminder option. And here I have a, you know, sorry for you uh, Android users. <laughs> I'm an iPhone person, so that's why I have the picture of an iPhone. Um, but I mean, all the, all, the, all the smartphones have pretty much the same features, right? They have the timer, they have the reminders. Um, so, you know, you wanna, you, you wanna teach them how to put in reminders about due dates, about assignments, about, you know, um, who, if they're in a group, who's in the group, what's their contact information. And then, you know, the calendar that I talked about could be on their phone. There is a wonderful calendar feature on their phone that they could be using and where they could be inputting all the due dates from all the different teachers. Calculator, of course, but only for simple computation. Um, it doesn't have the functions feature, uh, but you know, if they have to like do a quick computation, um, they could use their, uh, their calculator. Their camera they're using their camera with or without us anyways right they're doing those TikToks and they're doing the you know things on snapchat and instagram so we might as well encourage them to use it for um educational purposes and have them like either record their answers with a camera or role play or whatever assignment you have them do and voice memos um 
I don't think this is a feature that is um, explored enough by special education teachers. We always talk about providing different modalities for, um, for engagement and for um, answering questions or responding to certain tasks. So, you know, we could have them record their answers in the voice memo and share it. And this is something that we could, you know, teach them how to, how to use. Um, so this should cover some of the tips for the organization component of the, um, of the pillars. And we're gonna move on to the content. So for the content, you wanna find, create, and use content that is creative. So we don't just want reading material. Um, you could use videos, you could use like Facebook videos, Snapchat, Instagram, or podcasts via iTunes, or, or create interviews, um, use blogs, or even just as simple as using, you know, images, images with inspirational quotes or funny quotes or uh, beautiful pictures. So just to spice it up a little bit so that it's not just reading material because we all know that our students struggle with reading. So if this is the only thing that they are going to be exposed to and required to do, um, they are going to easily give up. So we need to make it a little bit more creative um, and I'm sure, you teachers out there are super creative. You are the most creative people ever. Um, so I'm sure you have great ideas to do so. We want to make it interactive. So we want to create discussions, group activities, um, maybe journals. Um, you ask for their feedback. Maybe you ask questions during synchronous sessions. You know, if you're using GoToWebinars, you could use that feature with raise your hand or you could have those poll questions. Maybe you require that students respond to each other or reflect on an image or a video that you've posted just to you know, um, make it interactive because there is this notion that, that when you're doing online, um, it's not interactive. It's just like you know, you're watching something on your own, but that's not really true. I mean, right now we're, we're, we're being interactive with the poll questions and the raise your hand option. Um, and then if it wasn't such a large group, we could have, we could have unmute you and have you like participate with your voice. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a it's a huge group. So we cannot have that option available right now. Uh, but it is it could be interactive if you make it interactive. And basically, when you're doing creative things and you're making your online classroom interactive, it's definitely going to be engaging for students. And we want to think about um, uh, provide activities that make students think that you know, we already talked about listening to a podcast or watching videos, including a discussion about it. But I also like to add, um, uh, talk about current events. So, you know, maybe if you want, if you're in, you know, if you're working on writing or if you're working on reading comprehension, um, have some article about not having sports anymore, right? During this pandemic, or, you know, discuss your online learning experience. Um, maybe you're spending too much time at home. How are you dealing with boredom? You know, write something about it, reflect on it. Or even like, you know, I don't know what they watch, whether the, their parents are watching CNN or Fox News or, uh, but ask them, you know, um, the, the CNN anchor Cuomo, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he, um, he caught the coronavirus and he was, you know, broadcasting from his basement and he was providing day-to-day um, -day updates. So maybe you can talk about that if they are, you know, if they are watching, you know, he's still working, he's sick. How do you feel about it? Would you do the same? Would you do things differently? So be current about events because this will engage them. And this is how you, you know, when they're engaged, you could build skills, you could improve skills, um, and they will actually be uh, interactive with you. Um, you, you know, we talked about building all those uh, components to your content, but you also want to be careful that you build your content based on existing reading, writing, and math skills. And this is a critical component for students with IEPs. We already know they are struggling with the four skills necessary to be successful online, right? We said the four skills were reading and writing, independent learning, um, motivation, and computer literacy we do not want to add to the struggle. 
Now, many districts in Illinois have sent information about the new online classroom grading policies, and they are pretty lenient, right? Um, I'm not sure about your district, but there, there, there aren't any state tests for, for the spring. Um, none of them will take place. Even the SAT has been canceled for spring 2020. Um, so this is an opportunity to move away from grade level content and start building up students reading and writing and math skills from where they're at, right? How many times we wish we didn't have to comply to the literature book that we're using or to the algebra two for you high school teachers, like, you know, oh, I wish I didn't have the, to use the algebra two book and I could go back to the basics and teach prerequisites. Well, this is the time you can do this now. Um, so, I mean, like I said, when the first slide I started with, this is an opportunity to meet the students' specific needs. So, we talked about summary. Make sure that you are asking students to summarize what was completed during the session, like I said, so that you know who's really listening and who's in la-la land. Um, and what is expected for the next day. And this is, again, very important because especially if you're assigning homework or independent work, you wanna make sure they know uh, what they need to do before you let them go. Because otherwise, if they're struggling, if they don't understand it, they're either not gonna do it or they're gonna go um, ask their parents or an older sibling. And it's, you know, it's not gonna be independent work anymore. Um, so this is really important that before you leave your session, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, make sure that they understand what is expected next. <clears throat> okay. Um, and the final thing that I think I will talk about for content is to prioritize. So I wrote, the three R's meet the four C's. Yeah, it's not gibberish. I'll explain. <laughs> uh, the three R's are reading, writing, and arithmetic. So these are the basics. These are this is a, these are the core of every learning, right? And the four C's of the twenty fourth the twenty first century. Uh, these are uh, critical thinking. So critical thinking would involve um, interpretation and analysis reasoning, constructing arguments, problem solving, um, and then systems thinking. You have communication, which is leadership, cooperation, flexibility, responsibility, productivity, um, collaboration using digital media. That's important. Um, and then you have um, communication, which is uh, effective listening, delivering oral presentations, um, engaging in conversations and discussions. And then finally, creativity, which is idea generation, idea design, openness, courage to explore, uh, working creatively with others. Um, those four C's were developed, um, I think, in um, around the year 200, uh, 2012. Um, and that was like, you know, they, they were... Uh, people got together, educators got together around the world, and I think it was a UNESCO conference, and um, they said, you know, these are the, the critical skills um, for the 21st century, and mastering the four C's is essential for successful participation in today's economy. Um, those skills, those four C's, are what most employers look for nowadays. So when you think about bringing the four C's to your online classroom, right? You're all teaching reading, writing, and math. Um, even if you're doing science, even if you're, if you're doing social studies, um, those disciplines require reading, writing, and math. So when you think about bringing the four C's to your online classroom, you really don't want to add a thing because the best way to master those skills is to change how we teach and learn in our classroom. And the four C's are skills where many of our students with IEP struggle with. So having them incorporated into our online classroom is of immense importance and benefits. So that's why I said you want, you, you want to prioritize. Um, if you can move away from the required content, 
and I'm not saying do so, but if, if it is a possibility or even use the required content to build those uh, those four C's. And this is like saying that saying, uh, give me a fish, you'll feed me for one day, but teach me how to fish and you'll feed me for a lifetime. So I made up my own uh, saying, so teach me content and I'll learn for one day, uh, but teach me the four C's and I'll learn for a lifetime. Um, so just something to think about, about bringing in the four C's into your um, online classroom and prioritizing those skills um, because they, they, are, they are really important um, and they could help improve um, tremendously reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, moving on to the third pillar of, of the online classroom, which is communication. I'm just gonna check the time real quick. Okay. Oh. Okay, we're running a little bit behind. So let me, you wanna clearly outline expected behavior and the support system. Um, so basically, you know, you wanna talk about what we call netiquette, which is the ethics of the net and it's called netiquette. Um, so you wanna talk about, um, um, you know, students need to recognize that the online classroom is in fact a classroom and certain behaviors are expected uh, when they communicate with both their peers and their teacher. And, um, you know, those guidelines for online behavior and their action are, are known as uh, netiquette. And you want to um, send weekly announcements uh, send reminders about quizzes and due dates. Um, and then you clearly want to state the time commitment for activities and assignments because our students don't really, um, are not very good at estimating how much time something will take. So it would be uh, beneficial if you provide that time frame, that range. Like this worksheet should take between um, you know, five to seven minutes or five to 10 minutes, no more. If it's taking more, then something is not right. Um, so it's important to provide um, that, that component for our students because it will help them. It will help them st structure their time and it will help them estimate like, okay, when is something wrong? And know when am I doing good on time? And when am I, I, I like, I got this, I know how to do this, uh, this assignment. Um, you want to provide multiple options for students to demonstrate their learning. And this is here, I want to emphasize the principles of universal design for learning. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, where you're providing multiple means of engagement, representation, action of expression. Um, so we talked about previously, you know, um, having giving the opportunity for students to record their their thoughts instead of uh, instead of writing them, and of course, whenever possible, you want to select videos that provide options of displaying closed captioning. And nowadays, most YouTube videos have that option. I think that's a, some type of a law um, that you have to have uh, closed captioning for your videos. And you want to keep your synchronous activities relatively short and focused. Um, there's a research that I came across um, that says, you know, face to face for uh, younger students should be between five to 10 minutes. Um, and then for older kids, uh, it shouldn't be more than 40 minutes. Now, I don't know how applicable this is for your school district, but this is something that I just thought I would, um, I would share and put out there for you to consider. Um, you really want to communicate your backup plans. So think about the different scenarios where something could go wrong. You know, students need to know what to do in case they miss a session or in case they forget their password. Um, the backup plan is really important for our students with IEPs because it will provide one, a sense of security, and two, some accountability if something goes wrong. There are no excuses, we have a plan, um, you know how to proceed. Um, so this way we kind of, you know, reduce the, um, how, how much procrastination happens if we have those backup plans. And you want to include your availability with clear contact information. And in no way I am suggesting you share your personal phone number, uh, but you want to tell them like, you know, I am available online um, on this day from this time to that time. If you send me an email, I will respond within, you know, 24 hours or whatever works for you and whatever you have set up with your district. Um, moving on to the fourth pillar of the online classroom, with this, which is interaction. 
and I'm trying to move faster because I know, um, you know, we only have <laughs> about 15 more minutes and we didn't get to the Q&A yet. So students want to interact with you, hopefully, right? And they want to hear your feedback because your feedback uh, will motivate them to improve their performance. It's um, simply, um, you know, they, they, they're looking, they're, they're looking for that interaction. Um, they, they want to talk to you. They want to interact uh, with you. And, uh, you know, that, that's important. You want to explain the rules of interaction. Um, so, again, we talked about netiquette, but also you want, you want to tell them to be respectful, not to type in all caps because that's inappropriate. Um, you know, you want to explain to them that grammar and spelling do matter, even if we're chatting, uh, not to post inappropriate material, um, you know, and tell them if you wouldn't say it to someone's face, then don't say it online. Um, so these are some of the rules and in interaction in each one of you will have um, their own rules and it's going to look different for different teachers. Um, consider dedicating a few minutes for check in stories and what I mean by checking stories, like, you know, give five minutes at the beginning of the session to talk about, you know, what was, uh, you know, tell me something funny you did, uh, you did today, or tell me something boring you did yesterday, or tell me something strange that happened. Um, so just to kind of have them talk about um, uh, something that related to their daily lives and then ease in the transition to the more, to the more serious uh, uh, academic stuff. Um, and then you want to consider creating short, fun videos using your webcam or smartphone. You don't need to be a video expert to, or create like a Hollywood quality movie. Just create a two to three minute video per lesson. Your students are going to love watching you, um, especially if you're being yourself. Um, so don't be afraid to make mistakes. Make sure you're authentic. Uh, uh, it's it's your personality that's shining through those videos. And you know, research does show that videos in which the instructor speaks or the teacher speaks in natural, conversational manner with an enthusiastic tone, these are the videos that are most engaging. Okay, so consider those so short, fun videos uh, for your students. Um, when possible, and I'm not really sure what your guidelines for your districts are, but consider having a daily face-to-face check-in. We are dealing with a global crisis where our students are locked down in their homes. Um, some are dealing with anxiety, some are dealing with fears. So a daily check-in is important to address this emotional toll. Um, in addition, of course, to checking on academics, and especially for students with IEPs, their success in the online environment is going to be directly uh, uh, related to how present and engaged everyone is in the virtual classroom. And it's not to burden you with, with more pressure than you already have, but, but this, is, this is the reality. So when possible, have a daily face-to-face check-in. Um, help students connect to each other when possible by creating forum discussions, chat groups, and this is important in the COVID-19 era. Students feel isolated. Um, this will act as a gateway reason for reconnecting with other humans, as well as promoting, you know, collaboration and interaction. And also know that for some students, um, the familiar feeling of perceived anonymity online creates a non-threatening environment where interaction can flow. So students who might not participate in your face-to-face -face class um, because they feel intimidated by others might, to your big surprise, um, be you know, some of the best participants and um, interactive students in your classroom because they have that kind of feeling of security that no one's watching, right? Um, it's anonymous, so I can say whatever I wanna say. Of course, within the rules that we set and the expected behaviors that we <laughs> communicated, right? All right, so now let's put it all together. When we provide accommodations within the four pillars of the online classroom, which are organization, communication, content, and interaction, then we will increase proficiency in the four skills that are required for the online learning. And I'm really hoping that uh, the tips that I gave you will help you achieve that goal. A um, couple of things before we wrap up. 
I want you to be aware of some of the online fearful behaviors. So um, some students might be fearful of um, not being proficient with the learning tools. Let's say you giving an online graphic organizer or you're asking them to download a certain app. So they might not feel very, um, um, you know, safe or uh, proficient in completing those, uh, um, those, uh, you know, those assignments that you're doing. They might have fear about technology, like, you know, if they're using text to speech for the first time or a dictation feature for the first time. Um, they might be fearful about their, their ability. Uh, some of them know that they're reading and in, in, in writing be below grade level, so they might be fearful that you're providing an, um, um, material that they will not be able to uh, attend to. Change, fears about change. A lot of people fear change, so this is something that we need to acknowledge. And lack of connection, lack of human connection, um, and this is also something to, um, to consider. So we want to discourage procrastination. We want to acknowledge fears. Um, you can send a brief tutorial on how to use your selected tools, right? We talked about those short videos. Um, we talked about suggesting multiple means of response engagement, you know, type responses and chat boxes, voice thread, personalized video clips, and those go along the line of uh, the principles of universal design for learning. And then we want to proceed at the student's own pace. We want to scaffold and chunk. All right, so let's recap. We want to view learning as an opportunity for individualized learning. Right? We want to see it as something positive, as something that will help us achieve our IEP goals. We want to recognize the four skills for successful online learning. The four skills are reading and writing, independent learning, motivation, and computer skills. We want to recognize the four pillars for the online classroom and plan accommodations. Right, The four pillars are organization, communication, content, and interaction. Accommodating within those those four pillars will help us achieve uh, our goal of successful of being successful online. You want to address online fearful behavior, discourage procrastination, and I just want to tell you that you are awesome. Remember that you are awesome and that you got this. We will we will get through the end of the year and we will do our best. And I know that you will do your best to have your students. Um, successfully uh, weather this uh, this horrible, horrible storm that we're all living in. Um, so I have some resources for you that you could uh, use and uh, uh, some, you know, for tools for online learning and uh, just some tips and suggestions and ideas that you could use. And you will have those uh, links uh, once we uh, share the PowerPoint presentation. And if you have um, any additional questions about this presentation, you could either contact Dr. Lynch or myself, and I have both emails on there. So thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Um, really appreciate your presence, and I really hope that this was uh, helpful. And please don't, you know, remember to um, uh, take the survey. It will take less than two minutes, and it will really help us build the rest of this uh, webinar series. Thank you so, so much. Dr. Lynch? Dr. El Hajj, do you have a few minutes for a couple of questions? <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, yes, we've got a lot of comments and a lot of questions. Uh, one is uh, a question about how can we form groups online? So um, you could uh, assign, it depends on the uh, learning management tool that you have, uh, the learning management system, but simply you could uh, have them work together uh, on, a, on a particular assignment and they could as simple as email each other or Zoom with each other or, you know, go to meetings with each other um, uh, on their own time. So you would set like a, some type of uh, um, kind of like steps for them to follow. Like, you know, you two are working together or your three are in a group. Um, you can use Zoom to discuss, um, this is a rubric, et cetera. Uh, and you, you'll just explain to them uh, what tools they use to communicate, and then they can, you know, they can do it um, online. And related to that, how do push in special ed teachers and aides assist in an online forum with the entire class present? 
that's a good question. Is this about uh, uh, co-teaching? I believe so, yes. Push in okay. special ed teachers and aides, yes. Well, this will this is going to require a lot of planning between the general education teacher and the the, the special education teacher prior to uh, to being online. Um, this is like I said, unprecedented. So to talk about like a co-teaching situation, uh, online co-teaching situation, I haven't heard of it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's 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 you know it cannot happen. But there's I mean there's so much that we are exploring nowadays with this transition to e-learning with everybody doing e-learning. Um, but it I think it's more about the pre-planning um, and having the co-teacher kind of help the general ed teacher do the necessary modifications and accommodations for that particular lesson, more than so the actual online presence of both teachers together, right? And if they were to be present together at the same time, then also that would need planning uh, because you know you would kind of want to uh, talk about discuss dividing the roles just like you're doing in the face-to-face -face classroom what is the general ed teacher doing uh, what is the uh, co-teacher doing and this is all pre-planned and then executed during the face-to-face -face time yeah great point i know some of these uh uh, applications like uh, Zoom have uh, the ability to put uh, to make groups as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question: I teach K2 autism, mostly echolalic and three-minute attention spans uh, in class. They mostly use their hands on activities. Will these be suggestions for those types of students? Well, again, um, every group is going to be different, and the more we go on the severity of the spectrum the more we are talking about additional support, right? So um, students who need support in the face-to-face -face classroom are going to need even more support in the online environment. Um, so I hate to say it, but this is when we're going to ask parents to step in um, and to be uh, our, our, our help in making this online classroom uh, possible. So. All the suggestions that I uh, provided, I was in my head, I was thinking students who have certain level of independence and more on the mild spectrum of the disability, uh, because the more we, I mean, you know, support, you know, students who need additional support and do not have that independence, remember, independent learning is important for online success. So if you don't have to start, if you don't have that to start with, then you're going to need additional support and that additional support. And uh, during these times, our parents who are also at home. Yes. Yes, uh, I know we're running out of time, uh, but maybe one or two more. Uh, another okay. person said, I, I really like how you've made this interactive. I wonder if we teachers could do something similar. It really depends on uh, the, the tool that you're using, right? So I know, for example, Zoom has the raise hand feature, right? Um, but a GoToWebinar has the polls feature that uh, that I included. So you want to ask your district about some type of platform that is interactive because I mean you see we can make it interactive we just have to have the the proper tool. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody also mentioned that uh, you did a lot you gave a lot of additional examples that aren't in the slides. Is there any way that they could get a hold of those? Um, you will just um, I need time. <laughs> I am going to write it up uh, and then uh, if you give me some time, I will have all those additional examples available for you. And other people are asking maybe they joined late and they didn't hear the intro. Everybody on the webinar will get the PowerPoint slides and will get a link to this video so that you can view it again, share it and uh, you know go into a little bit more depth. So, uh, so let's see, we are at 930. I know some people have uh, other webinars and classes to get to. So uh, it might be wise for us to uh, start on time and end on time. But uh, we can't thank you enough, uh, Dr. Elhaj, for this uh, really timely and uh, thorough 
uh, presentation full of uh, tips and uh, we really appreciate your time and your and your um, passion for the topic. Uh, also want to remind everybody as we wrap it up here, we will be asking you to do a brief two minute survey to give us some feedback on the webinar and to give us some ideas and tips for topics that you'd like to see in future webinars. So at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Thank you again, Dr. El Haj, and uh, wish everybody- My pleasure a safe and healthy uh, uh, rest of the week and uh, moving forward. So take good care, everybody. Hope to see you next Thursday. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.